SCP.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Bold Inventor Show. I'm J.D. Hubner, patent attorney owner here at Bold Patents. I'm with my co-host, Matt Colseth. Matt, good afternoon. Great afternoon, my friend. How's everything going? Going good, man. Really good. Uh, we're uh, all, all as well. The weather's great out here, uh, here in the Pacific Northwest, in the great state of Washington. Uh, how are things out there in Minnesota for you? Oh, things here in Minnesota are going so good. Oh, that's so great. Good. And you're up in your cabin. You were chatting before as you opened up your cabin. Yep. Uh, Minnesota's cabin country. So, you know, a lot of folks will try to get up north, you know, towards Canada. Right. Every, uh, every weekend to cool off in the lakes. That's great. So you kicked out all the, you know, what, possums and raccoons and bears out of your cabin? Oh, yeah. Just so many bears and yeah. you know, mountain lions. Yeah. Yeah. Just under the okay. cabin. <laughs> well, we got a big show today. Uh, for those of you who are tuning in live, we uh, encourage you to participate. Feel free to uh, like and subscribe if it's your first time watching. Um, and we're going to ask you to uh, participate by asking questions. We'll do live Q&A throughout the whole program. I've got about five to ten minutes where we're, uh, Matt and I have got four preloaded questions that came in over the week. But please interrupt us. Raise your hand. Shout out something non-obscene. We'll be happy to get to your question. Even if it's not legally related, we're here to provide legal information, not legal advice. So the disclaimer here, as always, is we're not your attorneys yet, unless you're a client, then we are. Um, welcome. Um, but please, if you do have a question uh, that does deserve confidential attention, we will have you book a free discovery call to see if our firm is the right firm for you. Whether it's patents, trademarks, trade secrets, um, or gosh, we even talked about this uh, marital advice. Whatever you need, we're here for you. Yep. Uh, I'm kidding on the marital advice. Uh, but we're, we're happy to help. Okay, there's that weekly live link. And you'll get a copy of this book over here uh, for the podcast listeners. It's Bold Ideas, The Inventor's Guide to Patents. Um, we have a guest waiting backstage, Mr. Nami Kadem. We're going to get to him really soon. I'm excited to have him on from ND Products, um, healthcare products, I should say. Uh, but I want to share some breaking news, Matt. How was that? Nice. Look Thank at that. About a week ago, and we don't get many of these, we had a presidential patent decision come down from the Federal Circuit. Um, Remind me, what's the federal circuit and why is it important for patents and trademarks? Oh, my gosh. So in the federal land, which is where patents and trademarks exist, meaning we're not beholden to any state laws. We're free. We're nationwide. The court system is the district court. So there are districts, many districts, two, three, four. Some states mainly have one because they're small. And the district courts, they answer to one federal circuit. And then, of course, the only place to go from there is the Supreme Court. So it's this giant circuit. They end, and there's these, you know, nine different districts. Um, and so anyway, this whole different system, separate from Superior Court, right, state Supreme Court, uh, we're on the federal side. So with federal law, this, the federal circuit is the, just the one step before the Supreme Court. It's a really because big they're, the, they're ostensibly the experts, correct? The experts, Absolutely. So I'm going to I'm going to get to the facts here. Um, the case is LKQ Corporation versus GM Global Technology Operations LLC. It's a mouthful. You're not going to remember the name of it necessarily. Let's call it LKQ. Is this a is this a door handle case? Yes or no? No. Oh, sorry, man. <laughs> this is about a design patent, though. Okay? OK, design patents. They are changing the precedent. So for there's 400,000 design patents out there today that are not expired, meaning patent holders that own you know, enforceable design patents. Probably, probably the, not one today walking around. Perfect. Exactly. You, you saw someone, if you've been out in the public at all, even on TV, you probably saw an inventor who owns a design patent. Yeah. They're on shaky ground now. Just because you get a patent granted doesn't mean you're locked in. The law changes, and so now those may be subject to invalidation the way this law shakes out. The, the circuit, the panel said, you know what? Obviousness, which is one of the core tenets of getting a patent, right? It has to be novel and non-obvious. Obviousness should no longer follow the age-old standard that we have been going by. Okay, in the Supreme Court in 1982 and 1996, affirmed what's called the Rosen-Durling test that simply said for a prior art or an infringing design, it has to be basically the same. That's the test, basically the same. 
visual impression as the patented design. For years and years, ago, that's what that's the, that's what won the day for um, Apple over the Samsung device, right? We've talked about this word with a single button at the bottom. Yep. Um, and the Egyptian goddess, all the same. But now they're saying, no, you know what? We should be looking at it the same as utility patents. And so they're now forcing the same standard under KSR, which is the since 2007, than the traditional utility patent analysis, which is about the TSM, which is, is it the same, um, you know, TSM, sorry, the same subject matter, it's the same, uh, I'm blank on this TSM. I'm going to click on this, don't do this. Yeah, teaching, suggestion, and motivation, right? Is there anything in the, in the infringing or the prior art that would suggest or teach or motivate the same, you know, what's, what's trying to be patented, right? Hmm. So it's a whole, it's a much broader, right? Much broader body, not basically the same. So they're saying, hey, in order for, for, for a design patent to get through, you now have to meet this harder, more difficult standard uh, under the KSR language. So that can invalidate a lot of these design patents where now there could be a lot more prior art brought before <clears throat> um, the examiners. So, and it'll be tougher to get a design patent. So Interesting. not a lot of people like it, but that is a, an update here. Yeah, no, I, I would I would think not. Typically, you know, if you can't get a utility patent, then you would look to maybe get a design patent, right? In, yep. in the alternative, but um, yeah. yeah. It, it, it'll like to still be much easier with the design patent. For those who aren't familiar, you're looking at trying to protect the three-dimensional objects, okay? And so it controls based on the solid drawings. No words matter in the design yep. patent, just the pictures and drawings. With the utility patent, obviously, the written claims is what controls, gives you the, the rights. So, yeah, if we can't do the design patents, then we'll have to talk about maybe doing a trade dress application instead. That's right. And we'll go right down the hall to Mr. Colseth yep. uh, Chambers, where he, uh, he'll help uh, move something forward for you. Matt, we're going to do two questions each, rapid fire. These ones came in from our amazing Reddit people. These people are so nitpicky, nuanced. Yeah, and yeah, nitpicky yeah, take your hat to those Redditors. Hey, I'm going to have to put you on the hot spot first. Um, how to withdraw a trademark, okay? That's the, that's the header. Um, the question is, I've got a trademark pending, and I have a large company that will oppose me if I don't cancel. I've gone through and decided to withdraw. What's the process to withdraw or cancel my trademark? Yeah. So assuming, of course, your trademark application was actually opposed at the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board, TTAB, yep. then you will need basically the court's permission at TTAB in order to withdraw your application at the USPTO. So typically there's going to be a joint agreement between the parties that, you know, basically settled, set the terms of, you know, we're withdrawing this application and we're closing the case, essentially. It's what you're requesting TTAB. If there actually hasn't been an, an official opposition filed yet, um, then maybe you could kind of just do it on the side where you submit the um, the withdrawal notice um, to the USPTO through the, the online form through TEAS. And then um, in exchange, of course, the a third party would, you know, hold you harmless for any, any damages conceivably. Perfect. Excellent answer. Thank you for that, Matt. Let's jump over to patent land. This one came in two days ago. Um, I developed a new technology at university that I'd like to patent. I did not use any external money. Therefore, I want to file the patent myself. Since the details of the tech are not yet fully examined, and I need more time to develop, I decided to file a provisional patent application. I have two open questions. How far should I go into detail compared to a real patent? I'm going to take this first question first. I, I, have, I, have, a, I, have, a, I have another question I'd like to tack onto that. Sure. Should I hire a patent attorney? <laughs> yes. That's a yes. Right? Yes. Come on. This is complicated, right? This Especially is, when a couple things on this that just there, I hate them. There's no such thing as a provisional patent. There's a provisional patent application. Okay. And that's important to understand the difference. You don't get any rights by filing an application. Secondly, a real patent. Well, you likely what that means by there is a utility patent, it's a non provisional formal application. It is still a good question. A couple of different things to bring up here. When you're co-developing an invention with the university, usually, probably like 95% of the time, there's a professor, a researcher, someone else that's an employee of the university that will claim co-inventorship. That's usually why you're there. Possible that you're yourself a professor, you've actually independently invented it, 
they've at least got some resources they're providing. So yeah, I, 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 I mean, universities put a lot of money into research and development. And yes. Anything that comes out of those, you know, laboratories is theirs. Yep. Yep. So I think it's, it's, uh, it is odd that you as an inventor are filing this apart from the university. That, that just doesn't seem right. I would question whether and why the university itself is not filing on your behalf, why they're not hiring their own counsel to help support you. That's the route to go. They likely had almost zero financial interest in, in exploiting it commercially. They just want to have a, a license back to continue researching it. So I'd love to hear more about why you're filing independently, why you think you're kind of skirting. I think that's only going to cause issues. Um, filing provisional is a good idea, especially if you think more development is needed. It's the exact reason why you want to file provisional to do more testing, tweak it so you can add in more detail. You can't add new subject matter. But as long as you're refining, adding more detail, getting more granular with respect to what the invention is, that's what this time is for. So, yeah, I would say hire an attorney, especially for reviewing inventorship, ownership, uh, and then also look into um, preparing for the utility properly. Hey, right. J.D., yeah. how long can you stretch out um, a provisional patent application? One year. So you file it May 29th, 2024. You've got to file it by May 29th, 2025. Now, you have to file the non-provisional. Correct. If you do not publish during that period, let's say you kept everything under wraps and you're still developing it, it is possible to file a new provisional. And basically, as long as you didn't publish it or you know talk uh, outside of a confidentiality agreement, you take the risk that no one else has filed it during that year, and you can start it, do a new provisional if you got more more stuff to do. So it's a you know still a decision as to whether you publish, sell, or take to a trade show. Cool. Well, it's one forty-two. I got to bring our guest on, Matt. Yeah, let's do it. I'm, Thank you so much for waiting. We've got Nami Kadem. Thanks for coming to our show. Hi. Hey. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Uh, well, I'm excited to have you here. I do see just above you a patent looks like uh, above you. You've got at least one patent to your name. Is that right? Yes, that's one of my patents. Awesome. Well, good. Well, tell us a little bit about uh, your company first. Um, you've got uh, this is ND Products, right? Exactly right. <laughs> Yes, that, that's my company, and I founded this company back in 2016 after a series of success that I had in entrepreneurship and invention. I decided to establish this company, and since then, I've been developing the company and products and innovations. And uh, today, uh, we are in like many markets, like U.S. market, Canada and uh, Australia, uh, U.K. and a couple of other markets. And um, it's been a, uh, a long journey, actually. Uh, <laughs> Overnight success, right? <laughs> oh no, I you know that that that's that's um, that's the thing that I always tell other people uh, who are in the beginning of this uh, journey that never look at it like um, you know overnight success. Of course, it's not. Uh, right. It's gonna take a lot of time and effort in the making. And um, you really have to love what you're doing to be able to uh, uh, accomplish what you're planning to do. Gosh, I, I don't miss that. Why wouldn't you say that again? I'm going to stop the screen share. What you just said right there is a giant golden nugget. Please state that again, would you? Um, one of the things that I always, uh, you know, discuss with um uh, other inventors or entrepreneurs who are in the beginning of this route is that never look at it as overnight success. And um, even if you think about American dream that it's like going to happen very quickly, it's not like that. It definitely gonna take a long time, a lot of time and effort. And um, in order to be able to really, uh, you know, go through this route, you have to love what you're doing. And um, so basically, I would call it labor of love. <laughs> yeah, of course. And sure. that's, that's, um, that's how you can really, um, you know, take your time, put effort, and um, achieve what you're really, really looking for in this field. Love it. Well, I'd say there's someone out there listening here in the healthcare field. Maybe they've got a product or device they want to get started, and they're inspired by you. Um, they're wondering how to get started. Maybe they're at where you were before you started your company. Bring us back to kind of that first win, if you will, that first, this is something special. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. What was that thing? What was that moment? If you can remember. 
yes, um, I remember the very first moment when uh, was when I learned that uh, cotton swab is bad for you. You're, you're not supposed to put it in your ear. What? <laughs> Hold on. Yeah. Alarms. Alarms. <laughs> okay, I do that all the time. My wife has said not to do that. It's for the outside of your I'm always like, of course, it's for the inside. I'll get these huge chunks out. Okay, I don't... know a lot of people think that yeah. way. And the problem is that that's something that's been around. It was invented back in 1921. So we were looking at the over a century old product that is still being used the same way. But, um, you know, for the last at least 20 years that I've been involved with this, uh, you know, people have started to pay more attention to it. Like I was one of those very first people who focus on this area because I was puzzled by the fact that doctors said, don't put it in your ear. And then yet everybody else's do it. And so I went out there, you know, I, I look uh, more closely on the package, like Q-tip is, is one of the name brand there. So right. on the Q-tip says, do not put it in your ear canal. And um, I, the question got bigger and bigger for me. And um, as an inventor and somebody who is who could get really curious, uh, I said, this is not making any sense to me. I have to get to the bottom of this. So I went around, I talked to people, I talked to doctors, I browsed markets here and there and check all the products that could be in uh, like ear care shelf. Yeah. And um, I, I realized this, this area was like a, a very um, um, area that nobody really cared for that much. Right. So back in my time, uh, you would Google ear cleaner, only cotton swab would pop up. And <laughs> right. right. And I guess, uh, you know, I, I had campaigns about it like that. That how it became so important for me. I said, like, it, it looked like a life mission for me because, you know, I, I found something that nobody else's care. But uh, then I learned that it, it is a big issue and is a common issue. So I thought people should start caring about it. And even some doctors, you know, weren't ready to talk about it because everybody were looking at it as a myth. Like they, nobody really knew what's the right thing to do. Um, so the doctor would say, you know, just come to our office and we will wash your ear. And it's very uncomfortable, messy process, which you have to spend a lot of time and a lot of money uh, if you don't have the best insurance. Um, so, uh, and then you want to do it almost once a week. Can you go yeah. to the doctor once a week just to clean your ear? I don't think so. That's so, <laughs> no. right. So I, I thought maybe, you know, as a designer, inventor, maybe I should, uh, maybe this is like my route. Maybe this is something I should focus on. And I did. And the more I went further, the more I found there is really need um, uh, needs um, of a good product in this uh, market because we were lacking of it. The other stuff that were out there were very, very hazardous, like uh, tiny rods that you could put in your ear and with the smallest accidental movement, you could puncture your eardrum and go deaf for life. No. So, and there are still out there on the market. Unfortunately, I, I couldn't find fight everyone. So, <laughs> um, yeah, th that's the situation we're having. So, um, you know, I, I uh, started developing a product that can solve the issue uh, in this most simple way. So um, we've seen all these big kits with all these different, you know, spray and syringes, this and that. And we know people are busy, you know, they are not into this stuff, really. Uh, they don't enjoy doing these things. Uh, they just want to take care of themselves and move on. And um, so I thought the simplest way is the spiral method for ear cleaning. And I patented that back in a day as a method for earwax cleaning. And then the result of that uh, after developing the product was a smart swap, which was the world's first spiral safe ear cleaner. And uh, back in 2014, I guess uh, there was a big invention show 
uh, that I attended and, uh, you know, I won a gold medal and the recognition and that helped uh, kind of was very helpful in the process because the entrepreneurship and inventorship is uh, is kind of a lonely route. So uh, <laughs> and and then when you get those kind of recognition, it really give you some energy. So, um, yeah, so that made me to feel like, OK, I'm, I'm on a uh, right route and let's move on. And then after that, I developed this product and <clears throat> uh in 2015 we launched it on the market and in 2016 it became a big hit and it got to uh so many chain stores like cvs you know bed bath and beyond Walmart. i'm out right there so how did it become a big hit was it you didn't get on shark tank did you i mean what what sort of promotion how did you market the invention yeah probably i partnered up uh with a large marketing company okay with, very capable and they have very large uh you know distributions across the country and abroad and um you know and also when it comes to that you you also have to agree with so many different things because you're gonna give away most of your interest and wow. right and at that time i wasn't in a situation to do this by myself so i had to get their help and and so Basically, I started working with them, and they were very uh, helpful to in bringing it to the market. Especially when it comes to the chain store, it is uh, something that takes a big company to do because they are very picky about the distributions and how they want things done. Um, so it has to be done by a company that uh, been there, done that. Can you share the name of the marketing company? uh the marketing company it should be on the package but it, it, they are gone and i'm not doing business okay. with them this is just the history got it sure no thank you i thought if they're still around you like them great but no they're right a couple of years i i we came down to some disagreements and i decided to uh depart from them right. um, one of the downside of big companies is that uh, you are um you are not all the business they have, right? And for example, for me, that was everything. So I put so many years work on it. That was everything for me. But for them it was one of the products they would promote. And unfortunately, sometimes these companies are careless and they just want to grow big and fast. And they take more than what they can do. And uh, at some point I realized my brand is being compromised a lot of counterfeits coming out and a lot of copycats and um real quick on that so did you go through the process of getting a federal trademark on um on your smart store? yeah I, I already had all that when, okay, uh, when these things happen right and uh, in, one of the advantage of what you guys doing is to get you prepared to go to these big companies because yeah. big companies like to see you having a patent and trademark excellent so, that yeah was went during the transaction right right but again as uh you know as if you don't have much experience you may think patent office is a big brother that can support you everywhere uh, but all they do is processing some uh you know documents uh, and then for enforcing those documents you need attorneys yeah. right so so that's something a lot of inventors don't know um so it's great uh, to have a patents and all that but again uh, you have to really maintain it well uh because in the world we are living in especially all these you know uh countries around us that looking at the u.s market and trying to copy things uh it's not easy to uh, deal with everyone basically you could get overwhelmed basically. right right Absolutely. So now, hey, I want to um, I want to see if you're willing to. If anybody out there is watching, they want to reach out to you, perhaps get some advice, and maybe they're on their own journey somewhere. Can I provide your email address for them to reach out to you? Sure, no problem. I'll be happy to help. All right. So I've got uh, Nami at ndproducts.com. Uh, we're gonna go to our next segment. I want to um, keep you backstage because I may bring you back out after we do our Shark Tank critique. I know we didn't have that long interview. Thank you for offering your advice. I think there's some really good wisdom there, especially when it comes to going to market. And uh, being successful. So, thanks again for being a guest on our show, Nami. 
Sure, be happy to help. Thank you. Thanks, Nami. All right, Matt, let's do it. We've got about five minutes, man. We got uh, a shark tank review. This is in the healthcare field. That's all I'm going to give you right now. I'd keep you in the dark. Okay. Um, let's share a screen. Um, switch over to audio. Um, we have, uh... oh, here we go. We don't even need music, man. We, we can't even do, I mean, we'd have to make up our own music. Exactly. If I go grab my ukulele, you grab your ukulele. Let's do it. <laughs> Audio good? Yeah, great. Yeah. It's a company hoping to make a dent in the growing plastic waste problem. Hi, Sharks. I'm Achel. And I'm Russ. And we're Cabinet Health, the sustainable healthcare company. Did you know that the medicine industry produces 190 billion single-use plastic medicine bottles every single year? That's enough to make a line from here in Los Angeles to Australia 325 times. And of all of those bottles, only 3 to 7% are recycled. The rest end up in our oceans, our landfills, and eventually our bodies. Sharks, in my hand is the amount of microplastics that you unknowingly ingest every single year. That's 260 grams of microplastics, which is like consuming a credit card every single week. Wow. Cabinet Health is a sustainable healthcare company that's invented the world's first compostable and refillable system. Today, we sell and manufacture high quality over the counter medicines and supplements. And we're on a mission to eliminate single-use plastic, one cabinet at a time. We're positioned to change this industry entirely, and we're here today to ask for a $500,000 investment for a 2.5% stake in cabinet. So, Sharks, are, are you ready to unplastic plastic the healthcare industry? <laughs> sharks, in front of you is a sample of our products. It starts with our refillable, stackable, and super space-efficient bottles. Also right next to that is our compostable refillable pouches that meet FDA standards. And while they might look like plastic, are made out of backyard compostable materials. So I see you opening them, it's a child resistant pack. And then you hear that satisfying snap, that's the closure system. Cabinet promises customers that we'll provide our products less than the brick cabinet health. But Tony is also interested. Here's my offer. I'll do $500,000 and I'll do it at 10%. I think where you're really going to need help is in the operational excellence of scaling up. And that's really what, you know, the business at DoorDash we're all about. And in terms of what I've done, you know, in terms of my entire entrepreneurial career. Tony and Kevin will be curious if you'd be open to a creative deal structure where we can give you an opportunity to earn that equity investment back and you guys come in together. Go ahead and make your counter and see what they say. How about a deal where uh, you do three and a half percent each uh, in terms of equity, but we give you a royalty uh, where you actually earn your initial investment back. What's the royalty on each unit sale? Uh, we can do up to 2% of top line revenue until you have that initial investment. I'll tell you what we would do, you know, speaking on Tony's behalf. All right. You guys got a deal. Done. <laughs> so they got a deal. All right. They did a complicated deal there. Two sharks bit. Would you bite? Uh, containers no. with a utility patent top. No, I wouldn't. Uh, it, it seemed like, uh, so they were asking for, you know, a terrible amount of money for a very little sh uh, shares. Yeah, Do you they know? didn't take percent away, but yeah, and they, they offered up to give a you know royalty on number of units sold. Yeah. The whole premise, I believe, is just this idea of actual plastics uh, being used in single-use plastics. Um, I, I guess you know that that problem I, it doesn't weigh on me as much because I, I thought plastics are recyclable. Is that not true? At last uh, I checked, at so least where I, where I live, we recycle them. Um, I mean, I don't know if they go in like a separate hole in the landfill, you know. Well, I, 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 I'm right. Can't they get melted down and re and repurpose into recycled plastic? So it's interesting. It's kind of all based on that, and it's a lot of hype. And obviously, they do have a, a novel closure mechanism, probably uh, you know airtight, keeps it ergonomic, perhaps. Um, but I don't think on the patent side, um, it's specific to uh, medicines, which is great. Yeah, no. I, I, the I biggest positive to it is that 
their utility invention is really, I think, useful for any type of container mm. well outside of healthcare. That's the beauty of having a utility patent file. Um, so on the trademark side, real briefly, what do you think, Matt? Yeah, no, they've, they've done a really nice job covering their bases. They have multiple trademark registrations at the U.S. PTO, word marks, design marks, you know, retail store sales, products, information, um, downloadable software applications. So th they've really applied broadly and strategically. So I have no qualms with how they're filing their trademark applications. They look great. Yeah, and it's not an actual cabinet. So I think it's definitely suggestive. It's, you know, it brings to mind. Yeah, arbitrary, right? Yeah. So I think it's a decent one. Suggestive, it goes in the can. I don't, I, yeah. It's it's registrable is what it is. Registrable, but you don't actually love the business model. I, I'm kind of in the same boat. Nami, you're in the healthcare field with more devices and products, but talk to us about, you know, this type of concept. Does it resonate with you? We got you on mute, I believe. I'll take you off of mute. Let's see if I can do that. Okay, go ahead. Oh, looks like you've actually muted yourself. If you could unmute, we'll, we'll get your comment. Can there we you go. Me now? Yep. Oh, okay. I, I had the same thought as, as Matt because uh, I thought these are all uh, plastic and recyclable. So I didn't really get the point that what the difference is because, you know, all of this have to go to one, you know, particular space and then be melted down and become different product. So uh, I think I, I think the problem statement right was a little bit vacant. I think I've heard of the problem of you know putting prescription medicine down the toilet that could cause issues with water and maybe some of that. But I mean that's a totally separate issue. Right, um, right. But but as far as melting the plastic, like I yeah. I use hundred percent recyclable product, uh, you know, in my products. Uh, so even my silicon is the recyclable medical grade silicon uh, yeah. on my device. So I think as long as you do that, then you kind of uh, have a peace of mind. It is environmental friendly. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, we're at the end of our show uh, for, for Nami, uh, our guest. Thanks again for joining and commenting here for Matt, myself and Bold Patents. Wish you guys a wonderful day. And we'll catch you next week, Wednesday at 1.30 Pacific on the Bold Inventor Show. Go big, go bold. Thank you. See ya. Go big. Go bold at boldip.com.